Okay, last week we uh, finished up Hebrews chapter 1, and so this week we're going to get going in chapter 2. Uh, before we get going, I, I want to always make sure to take time to, you know, look at the bigger picture here before we get going. So, did anybody have any questions from what you read in Hebrews this week, or from what we talked about in Hebrews last week? Just a couple minutes. Anybody, just show me your hand or something if, if we did, Okay. Good? Okay. Let's go ahead and plow forward then. So, chapter 1 basically had this idea. Jesus is superior to the angels. Okay. Why is that important? Why why does that matter? And that's exactly where chapter 2 picks up at. He's going to talk about why it matters that Jesus is superior. So he says in verse 1, For this reason we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard, so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through angels was legally blinding, or sorry, binding, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord, and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles, and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit, according to his will. So uh, that takes us to kind of the, the application here, okay? So first off, if you notice, Hebrews 2 verse 1 starts off with the statement, for this reason. Um, so another way of saying it would be, since God spoke through Jesus instead of angels, we should pay attention, all the more so. Um, so, uh, you know, we definitely... Um, we don't think about this too much because people oftentimes will talk about how the law is so harsh and the God of the Old Testament is so harsh and the God of the New Testament, he's loving and, and everything in the Gospels is just about love and rainbows and butterflies and all that good stuff. And uh, here in this verse, it kind of just puts that whole concept up on its head. Uh, we have to pay attention to the Gospel even more so than they paid attention to the law. Uh, because it's 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 even the punishment is even more more severe, but also he makes the com he makes a comment that we should pay closer attention to it so that we don't drift, and that brings us to a very important idea that Hebrews hits over and over and over again, just repeatedly. In troubles, pay closer attention, because what happens is our natural tendency, our natural human tendency, is when th when we start facing conflict, when things start going bad, we we back off just kind of human nature. We get tired of dealing with it. We want to just kind of escape from it. Uh, you know, oh, well, I just don't really feel like the whole praying and God thing's even going to work, so I'm just going to kind of just go and do something that distracts me, and I'll just move on with my life. And uh, that's kind of the, the, the natural uh, thing that we all kind of fall back on, but it really doesn't help us uh, get anywhere. Um, so, verses 2 through 3, it picks up with this, For if the message spoken through angels was legally blinding, um, I said it again, legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So this is an argument that we see repeatedly throughout Hebrews. It's called lesser to greater. If this lesser, lesser thing is true, how much more are this greater thing? Um, so another way of saying that is, if this, how much more than that? So if the law is harsh, abandoning Christ is even harsher. And with that being said, uh, this kind of brings up a, a core Jewish kind of idea that angels were communicating the law to Moses. And here in Hebrews, he's talking more about how we didn't have an angel drop off a message. We had Jesus Christ come in person. And um, so it's all the more urgent that we pay attention. So that takes us to the rest of verse 3, which says, this salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So if you, and let me finish by reading verse 4. Uh, at the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. So if you have spent any time, um, especially with uh, the newer kind of scholars and atheists, they constantly bring up this idea of, did Jesus really actually say that he was God? Or was it the um, the disciples that just kind of came up with that after the fact? 
And now, obviously, we in the church, we know what we believe, right? Uh, but but their argument is basically that a lot of scripture was just kind of made up. It wasn't accurately recording what Jesus was saying. It was just just made up. Um, and, and so in in Hebrews, he gives us three. I'm sorry, four different things that kind of answer the question uh, for us of Did Jesus say he was God? Was was Jesus really God? The first um, thing that he said right there in verse three was this salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord. So right there you have Jesus. Um, Jesus gave it first. It was given first by Jesus. He, he spoke of the salvation first. He was the one who, who said it. He didn't just, the disciples didn't make up the words. And then it goes on to say, um, <clears throat> and was confirmed to, the, to us by those who heard him. So this gives the, the second little proof that Jesus was actually God. It, is, it was confirmed by the disciples. Now, this doesn't seem like that big of a uh, point in the favor of Jesus really being God if you don't believe in the Bible. But it actually kind of is, and I'll kind of explain why. Okay, so people will die for what they believe in all the time. I mean, really everywhere. It doesn't matter if, it's, if the belief is true or false. If they believe it, they'll die for it. But people don't die for things that they know is not true. Right? I'm not going to go to the grave when I know that there actually isn't an empty grave. I didn't really see this guy raise up from the dead. I'm not going to die for that because I'm like, eh. I mean, yeah, okay, I can believe in that, but when it comes down to me dying, now hold up. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so what their whole argument was the grave is empty. We saw him after he was resurrected. We touched him. We, so they were saying from, they were arguing from what they know. You have atheists nowadays who are arguing from what they don't know. Well, I don't know if Jesus has been raised. I don't know if he was real. But the disciples, they were arguing and dying for something that they knew was true. And people don't die for things that they know is false. So that right there gives us strong evidence between those two things. Um, <clears throat> especially when you, get, when you bring into the fact that, you know, Jesus was talking about, you know, the way of salvation and that either believes that he was a crazy person or a liar, but most people agree that he was a, uh, a, a rabbi, a teacher of sorts, a good person. Well, what kind of good person is crazy and what kind of a good person is a liar? So you have right there kind of a strong confirmation that Jesus is probably who he said it was. Um, so right there are two, two things that say that he was God, but then it doesn't stop there. Verse 4 picks up and says, At the same time, God, God being God the Father, also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles, and, di and distributions of gift from the Holy Spirit, according to his will. So we have two more things here. The first is that the Father testified by miracles. And, I'm sorry, the third. And the fourth is that the Holy Spirit also testified by gifts um, that were given. So if you notice, he said all these different um, kind of things here about the Father. He said signs, wonders, miracles. What are the differences? What's the difference between them? There really isn't that big of a difference between them. They're kind of uh, similar things. So if you go looking for like this distinct line in the sand of what constitutes a sign versus a wonder, you're not really going to find it. And in fact, most of the time in the Bible, they're going to say signs and wonders. It's kind of like an inclusive term. Um, like, so for instance, here's a good example of that. Um, when Jesus, uh, the Pharisees were asking Jesus for a sign that he was who he said he was, right? And he said, I'm not going to give you a sign except for the sign of Jonah, which was the whole three days in the, in, the, in the grave thing. Well, was that a sign or was it a wonder? Well, it was kind of both. And then it was kind of a miracle, too, because after being dead for three days, he was raised back to life. I mean, so if you kind of try and draw that line in the sand of was it a sign or a wonder or a miracle, you're kind of a little bit at a loss uh, because those things aren't really, it's more of just a way of being all-inclusive of what he's trying to get across. Um, so then, <clears throat> that takes us to the last witness there, the, the Holy Spirit testified by the gifts. And these would be the things that are mentioned a lot uh, in the New Testament, things like um, uh, prophecy and, and on all those things that are mentioned as gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, First Corinthians and whatnot. So here we have the fourfold witness that Hebrews is talking about, that Jesus was actually who he said he was. You have... Jesus said so, people said so, God the Father said so, and the Holy Spirit said so. So I think, yeah, probably, probably, yeah, he's, he's probably God then. And uh, 
So that takes us to verse 5. For he has not subjected to angels the world to come that we are talking about. So remember he's talking about in verse, verse 1 he picks up and he says this. For this reason we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard. And then we get to verse 5 and it says, For he has not subjected to angels the world to come that we are talking about. So uh, roll with me on this. We should listen better than the law. We should listen to Jesus better than the law since all things are subject to him. So uh, when he says for, for he has not subjected, he's referencing back to in verse 1 or 2 when he said, how can we reject such uh, this great salvation? salvation? And uh, that takes us to the idea of, um, well, here, I'll just read it here. Uh, how, how will we escape if we, if we neglect such a great salvation? For he is not subjected to angels. And you can kind of see how the, how the argument flows. And that's kind of how he does it a lot. In Hebrews, he'll mention something and kind of follow the thought through. But then he'll circle back to that idea and start building on it. And so pay attention to the fours and their fours in Hebrews because they keep doing that. He'll say something, slight detour, back, therefore, slight detour, for, therefore. And he'll keep going like that. So it, it, think of it like a series of rabbit trails in his main argument. So the fours bring you back to the main argument, but in between the fours and their fours are the rabbit trails. And they're, they're not really rabbit trails, but I'm just trying to help you kind of see how the, how the argument goes. One basic argument with these like branch-offs, like a tree. Uh, so then in verses 6 through 8, he again brings up another quote, this one from Psalm uh, 8, five, verses 5 through 7. And this entire psalm, Psalm 8, is, is about being in the awe of God. So it says this, but someone somewhere has testified. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly where I read it, but I know it's in there somewhere. Uh, what is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. Excuse me. And that's not the end of verse 8, but I'm going to stop there because so, I want to finish the rest of verse 8 with verse 9. So he's connecting some previous ideas that we talked about in the past couple weeks. Um, I'm sure you were, I'm sure you noticed some of them. Uh, the the concept of Jesus being lower than the angels because he was in a human form. Um, another concept that he kind of ties in there: the idea of how Jesus was crowned and became the heir, crowned, crowned in glory. Uh, how he's awaiting the initiation, all that. Um, the already and not yet thing. Okay, so so remember in salvation when we talk about salvation, we can say that we we can say that we are saved, but we're not yet saved. Like we're not in heaven. You can you can still back out if you want, right? <laughs> it's already but not yet. And it's the same thing with Jesus. He's already the ruling king. It's just that he's not yet taken that. Okay, so we're waiting for the time when the Father says, "Now," and then Jesus will come in glory. And that whole thing happens, okay? So, once again, these are all kinds of, kind of, these verses and stuff that he's quoting, they are tying in the ideas, okay? So, what is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor, and subjected everything under his feet. Which brings us to another kind of idea here. This psalm is also about us. Um, not all the Psalms are also about us, but this one is actually about us. So as it applies to us, what is us people that you remember us? Uh, or the Son of Man that you should care for us? What did we ever do? Uh, you, God, have made us lower than the angels for a short time. And that's right, because we're not always going to be lower than the angels. When the resurrection happens, we're going to be higher than the angels. Uh, so you made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory. We've been crowned with glory, especially in the in the resurrection and the new heavens and the new earth. And we're going to be given crowns and stuff. That Revelation talks about this. Things that we, <laughs> it's not because we're so great, although yes, we do get awarded for our for our works on life, but it's because we stand in, in the glory that Jesus uh, inherited and then passed on to us by his sacrifice. So, uh, and honor and subjected everything under his feet. Um, once again, you'll remember that humans are going to be um, rulers uh, in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, so we have a lot of ideas here tying in. And specifically in chapter 2, you're going to see how, as a human, Jesus had to do some things 
to, for lack of better word, validate himself. Uh, I know that's kind of a bad word. Um, because he was fully human, even though he was fully God, he was fully human. So as full, a fully human, he did have to do some things to, um, I, I can't really think of a good word right now, prove himself, that's not really right, uh, but kind of. So let's kind of move forward, and I'll be able to say it a little bit clearer as we kind of move on. Uh, in verses 8 through 9, this is the rest of verse 8. For in subjecting everything to him, Jesus, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. We don't, we don't see that yet. But we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time. So that's the, that's the quote that we just read. So that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor. Once again, there's another quote from the psalm that we just read. Because he suffered death. So, Jesus was made lower than the angels. We saw, we saw him then. That's what he's saying there. And he did that for the purpose of uh, death for everyone. And then he was crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Because he followed that through to the end. So, the Father will subject all things to Christ, although he has in name. And we can know from this and from other parts that the future is guaranteed. It's a promise from God. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It's just that it's not yet seen. And there's going to be a big theme that he comes, kind of hits on repeated in, in chapter 2. He's going to talk about how Satan is defeated, but not yet, too. So let's keep going with this. So we do see Jesus lower as a human to die in our place. And then we also saw him crowned in glory because he suffered our death. So uh, this is also... A, if you're familiar with, with um, I don't know if anybody is, but if you are familiar with, with Jewish writings and with Jewish thoughts, uh, they talked to, uh, Jew, Jewish, Jewish people talked a lot about, about the, the angels that were over the nations. Um, this, you can kind of see references to this in different parts of the Bible. Um, but once, if you don't really read more of the Jewish writings, you're, you, you might have missed it. Uh, Revelations talks about it. Daniel talks about it. Um, uh, I think Ezekiel talks about it. There's this idea that different angels were in charge of different realms or different areas uh, of the of the earth, and here, so you kind of have that silently contrasted. So he doesn't directly draw attention to the fact that that angels ruled over the over different nations, but he does kind of imply that Jesus is um, the fulfillment of that, the greater of that, uh, when he says in these verses there about the scepter and all of that. So, let's see where does that take us? Oh, and then right here, uh, sometimes verses are taken out of context to mean that Jesus, um, well, two things. Jesus only died for those who would be saved. And then the other thing that's kind of taken out of con context is Jesus, everybody's going to be saved because Jesus died. So uh, I think that, the, that these verses kind of address both both extremes. But if you look at this, it said um, he might taste death for everyone. So who did Jesus die for? For everyone. Not just for those who would be saved. He died for everybody. However, um, there's going to be in another part here where he talks about how it's those who uh, believe who will be saved. So it kind of hits on both both points. And no, no real, real room for a uh, wiggle room there, I guess. Um, so then that takes us to a big concept here. Now, hopefully, it's, don't put the uh, don't put the answers on the screen yet, Grace. So you can you don't have to actually go to the next slide at all if you don't want. Just probably keep it there. If Jesus was a human, okay. Now I want you to think about this. If Jesus was fully a human, then why couldn't I or you or anybody else have died as he did for salvation? Because he was sinless. Fully God and fully man. Yes, exactly. So there's two two aspects that in the New Age Christianity that is in a lot of Christian books nowadays is completely missed. Um, and the thing is, these are not new heresies. <laughs> these are thousands of <laughs> thousands of years old. Uh, the first thing is there's a God aspect. Jesus was fully God, and in that fully Godness, He was good enough to die on our behalf because He was perfect. He was sinless. Uh, but then there's also a second aspect which Hebrews really hits on, and that, that's that He was fully human. We don't really talk too much about this one, uh, but Hebrews talks repeatedly about it. Uh, and it's actually going to cause a 
problem here in just a, ver- a couple of verses where it's going to say that he was made perfect. And kind of like, eh, what does that mean? Pause. So, uh, but the human aspect, what that basically means is because he was God, so he became a human, okay? Because he was perfect, he was therefore accepted as a human. Jesus wasn't accepted as a human until he finished the course set before him. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, it gets a little bit confusing, so hold on to your shorts, okay? Let's let's keep plowing ahead here. Um, so he had to be God in order to be good enough. He had to be human in order to die in place of because it was man who sinned against God. So only God could forgive, but only God was good enough to forgive. So humans couldn't have died in the place. So you had this little bit of a paradox, and Jesus resolved the whole thing by him doing it. Um, and in that way, he did something that only he could have done. Uh, so why, oh why, is the author of Hebrews writing this? Well, he's writing this, remember, remember, he's writing to a church that left Judaism, and they're in Christianity, they're having second, they're having second thoughts. They're thinking maybe we should just go back to being Jews. It'd be a lot simpler, and so the, so they're having this kind of kind of setback here. And so, why is he writing them? He's writing them because they are suffering. They're tired, and he's reminding them why they are suffering and they're tired. Why are you are doing this? Uh, it's this is not a pointless rant. He's not just talking about angels for no reason. He's not bringing up these Old Testament passages for no reason. He's got a very important reason for why he's doing this, and uh, he doesn't want them to uh, to go back on their um, walk with God. So then in Hebrews uh, 2.10, we get into a whole different uh, kind of, I guess you could call it a paragraph, a whole different thought process. And the idea that he's going to go in here is the way we are family with Jesus. And this is the part where it gets a little bit confusing if you don't understand who Jesus is. So uh, most of you will, probably will not have a problem with this. I'm just going to explain anyways just in case anybody does uh, kind of get confused. So for in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, now some translations are just going to say sons, uh, don't worry too much about that. Um, the the word there is is something that that more is talking about the congregation of them, and since there are boys and girls in the congregation, sons and daughters, not really anything that you have to. It's a it's it's destroying the word of God. No, it's not. Uh, to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. See right there, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. That's where we're going to start hitting problems with this if you don't um, take into account all of who Jesus is. So, first off, he says, sons and daughters, very specifically. You remember before we were talking about the way that he died for everyone. Now we're going to hone in specifically on the church, not the world. Okay? For in bringing sons and daughters, well, that could still be talking about all humanity, except for this, should make the pioneer of their salvation. So who's saved? Those who believe. So he's very much so talking about the church specifically. So you have both of those ideas are not true. Jesus didn't just die for those who would be saved, the, the elect. He died for everybody. But then also, not everybody's going to be saved, only those who, who believe, who are sons and daughters. So God was involved in the creation and salvation process. Sometimes when we're, when we're dividing up the roles of the Trinity, we kind of get a little bit confused here. We say, okay, Jesus was responsible for everything to do with uh, salvation. And then the Holy Spirit is responsible for everything to do with like the, 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 the mystical stuff, like you know healing and stuff. And then the Father is responsible for all the harsh stuff. Uh, you know, he's, like, he's the one that's yelling, and Jesus is the one that's doing, or whatever, serving. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's equipping other people. And that's not really accurate, um, especially when you look at verses like this. It very much so clarifies... It was entirely appropriate that God, this is talking about the Father, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. And uh, it was, so you see that God the Father is actually involved in the process of salvation, just as he was involved in the process of creation. Uh, and then also notice that uh, we, this is an idea that's kind of built maybe a little bit mm, a little bit stronger in the book of John, but it is in Hebrews as well, the idea that when Jesus receives glory, that brings glory to the Father. 
It's kind of like a circular thing that happens. And you can see it in some of these quotes, uh, Hebrews 10, 2, 10, and 11, and a little bit earlier. Um, but uh, so just keep your eyes open for that bit. And uh, it says here that... So, okay, let me kind of say this a different way. If you back up to the end of 9, it says that he was crowned with glory. And now go and now if you go forward to uh, verses 10, it says, for in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. So uh, what does that exactly mean that he, he, he brought us to glory? Well, when you're talking about Jesus receiving the glory, you're talking about him entering into heaven, you know, inheriting the title, all that, uh, kind of walking in the, becoming, you know, the resurrected body and all that. So when you're talking about us, you're talking about our future hope when you're talking about bringing us into glory, um, the, the way that we have. Uh, and this is going to be something that, that's, that's kind of re- referred to later on, the way that we are made perfect by Jesus. So kind of remember this in the back of your head somewhere, and in a couple, in a couple weeks we'll, we'll hit back on it. Um, and that takes us to, to two, two concepts that, that we need to look at. The first one is some translations will read this differently than others should make the pioneer of their salvation. Some translations are going to say something along the lines of um, maybe source, maybe uh, hero, um, maybe uh, captain. The idea here, it, it could mean a, lot, a large array of things, including like a, like a Greek hero, like a uh, Hercules or something. Um, so if it was written today, it could be that Jesus is the superhero. But that's not really the idea. They could mean that, but the idea behind it is more like this. Jesus went before us and did what we are going to do. He's the pioneer of our faith. He's plowing the way ahead. Okay, so, for in bringing many sons and daughters uh, to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God the Father, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. So that brings us to the last, uh, so, so hold on, let me say this, I forgot to mention this. So we are fellow heirs with Jesus, okay? That means we are following in the path that Jesus went, which means that we are following into the way of suffering. That's kind of the big idea of Hebrews. Now, that he's, only, he's only hinting to it here, but in a, in a little bit he's going to, more than hint, he's going to hit it real strong. So... Uh, and then that takes us to the idea, make perfect. Now, what in the world does it mean for Jesus to be made perfect through sufferings? Anybody? It's a hard one, isn't it? Okay. So what does that mean for Jesus? So the question being, how can Jesus have gotten better? Yes? Could you build on that a little bit? Yes. Yes. In a nutshell, that is exactly what's being said. So I'm going to break it down a little bit, but Rick just hit exactly the nutshell of this. (laughs) This is one of those things that really doesn't, hit very good in English. <laughs> I, I wish that everybody could read the New Testament in Greek because it makes so much more sense. And there's some things that are just hard to translate in English. So the way, the correct way to translate this in English is make him perfect through suffering. That's the right way to say it. Like, and you're looking like any translation is going to say the exact same thing. That's how you translate it. But that's not really what it means. You know what I mean? It's, it's, ah, it's really hard to... God, one of those things. But it, it, it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, so, okay, the idea all throughout the book of Hebrews of something being made perfect is for it to be completed of a task or a purpose, okay? So we, in laying down our lives, are m- being made perfect, and once we die, we are made perfect. We are finished of the task, okay? We're finished of the purpose. Um, when something has completed its set forth goal, like Rick was saying, like Jesus did, he set forth the goal, the purpose, the task that was set before him, he it was made perfect. 
Um, this word is actually used, I think it's teleo if I remember correctly, it's used uh, of martyrs in some situations who have died, who had so finished the race. It's They were made perfect. Uh, so uh, there's a few things that I'm going to mention. I'm going to try to go through these kind of quickly so it doesn't bore anybody. First off, he being made perfect does not mean that there's anything imperfect with this character. It's not talking about a moral deficiency. Being made perfect doesn't mean... Well, I think that kind of clarifies that. It has an idea of being completed or finished rather than perfect like I did the job perfectly. Like we think of, we think of oh, here's a good way of saying it. We think in terms of perfect of, of quality of a thing, right? So like I, I did this on the computer perfectly. I couldn't have done it any better. And that's not really what the idea ha- uh, here, especially in the book of Hebrews has. It's used like a bunch of times throughout the book. The idea is to, to finish the thing. Not, we're not talking about the, the quality of the thing. We're talking about the thing having come to completion. So uh, try to look past that. Um, I'm going to say it in a couple of different ways of what Rick exactly just said. Uh, first off, he finished what he started. From the beginning, he had this plan to save people. He saw it through to the end. Okay? He was made perfect. Uh, another way of saying that is uh, he finished his human experience as a pioneer. So we, we knew that there was salvation coming. People were going to be, be resurrected. So he went before us as the pioneer of that. And in doing that, he finished the human experience to the end. He didn't just come as a human. He stuck it out to the end. Another way of saying that, he gained, uh, if you're a gamer, he, he gained the XP points necessary to level up. <laughs> uh, he, he, gained, he gained the experience of what he was lacking. So although Jesus was fully God, he did not have the experience of being a person. Okay, So he came as a person, became what he wasn't, while still remaining what he was. Okay, Does that kind of make sense? So he, he gained that experience, you know, went, went through the process. Um, and remember, he was a human. Okay, So as a human, he had to earn what he was due. Okay? When he, before he was a human, he didn't have to do that. But as a, if he wasn't, wouldn't have become a human, he wouldn't have been able to do the thing. The whole cross, all that. Okay, So he had to become a human in order to really do it. But in order to do that, now we have the problem. He is fully human. And so as a human, he has to prove himself. So, And this is why, G, why the Father said, because of your righteousness, I have anointed you above your companions. Because you have done this, I have anointed you. So... Uh, another way of saying that is maybe uh, that Jesus, by being made perfect, he obeyed completely. Um, you could say he set the example, he proved his resolve, uh, he died, finished the human life. Uh, and, and, and once again, go back, try to, I know we're talking about all these different ideas, maybe it's a little bit, ugh, it? bring it back in. What does this have to do? Because we also have to do the same. We also have to be made perfect by following in our pioneer's footsteps. This is why it's important that he's mentioning this. This is the way your pioneer went, so you are going the same. <laughs> That's where we're headed. And uh, remember, we're talking about somebody who's suffering. So how could Jesus possibly have been our pioneer if he didn't complete the task set before him? And uh, one last thing I want to draw attention to in verse uh, 10 it says here, um, for it was entirely appropriate that God should make the pioneer of their salvation. This is maybe not the best way of saying that. It kind of conjures up in our ideas, the, the, in, our, in our heads, the idea that the Father forced Jesus to. Get that out of your head. There, there are other translations that say it better. Uh, it's, it's, the, the, once again, the Father and the Son were in agreement. He talks about this in, in the Gospel of John. So um, that's just... Not really there. Verse 11 then goes on to say, or actually I wrote down a paraphrase of verse 10 um, just to kind of get it more across. It was fitting that God should cause the pioneer of their salvation to completely finish what he started. Yeah, that's good enough. Uh, So verse 11, For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So now we're going to this whole thing of we're family. Okay, now we're just kind of switching gears here. We and Jesus have the same Father. The one who sanctifies, that's Jesus, and those who are sanctified, that's us, all have 
one Father, God the Father. And that is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them, them being us, brothers and sisters. And uh, so he w- he's also com- m- making us perfect and completing the task. I already said that. Same father. Some different translations say it differently. Some of them don't say the same. Uh, have one father. Some of them say all come from the same family or something like that. Uh, it's, a, it's the same same concept either way. Um, so first off, th- th- there are two things with us being family that I think are important to note. You hear people talking about one, you don't hear them talking about the other. The first way that we are family with Jesus is because we are human and He was human. Therefore, we are companions. We are family. But then the second element of that is the one that you always hear people talk about. The way that we've been adopted in by his sacrifice and been made brothers and sisters. So there, there's two different ideas there, and, and both of them are accurate. I think it's important to kind of draw attention to both of them. So then in twelve verses 12 through 13, he does another quote, uh, this time from a series of verses. I'll try to hit them as a, well. There's Psalm 22, 22, and then the second one is taken from 2 Samuel 22, 3, or Isaiah 8, 17, or Isaiah 12, 2. And then the last one is taken from Isaiah 8, 18, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will, I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. Um, so once again, these are all kind of having to do with the congregation, which is the church. It says there, I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Um, that's the word that is used of the New Testament church, congregation. So uh, we are brothers and sisters, kind of that, that whole idea. Okay, so okay, here's one more thing I wanted to point out with this. Is that Jesus trusts in God as we must. See, as a human, he had to, tr- he had to trust. Trust doesn't mean to just believe something. It means to follow through on it, right? So if I trust in God, that's not just a feeling that I have in my head. That is, I'm going to now, there's going to be a, an action that follows suit with that. And in English, we don't really have that thought. Uh, Hebrew has the same idea, too. In Hebrew, to listen isn't just to hear. It's to listen and then, like, you know, do that. And that's exactly the same kind of uh, uh, connotation that, that, that's going on right here. It's not just the idea that, okay, yes, I'm hearing something, but I'm also doing it. So it says there, the second quote, I will trust in him. This is Jesus talking. As a human, he had to do this. As humans, we have to do this. And these verses that he quotes, they are all talking about family. They're talking about suffering and trust. Uh, They're all talking about God's dwelling with us. And uh, this is really funny because this is a huge stumbling block for the Jews, this whole section of Hebrews. We don't notice it because we're not Jews. (laughs) But this was like a huge stumbling block. So I just think that's kind of funny. We're talking about Jesus suffering and and being made perfect. This is the Messiah. He shouldn't have to do these things, which, I mean, is right. He shouldn't have had to take our bullet for us, right? We we had it coming. We deserved it. So that that's true. But the idea behind it with the Jews is is basically it, it, it's blasphemy to talk about the Messiah suffering. Um, this is something he's, you know, too good for that. Uh, maybe we're saying that. And... Um, so then you're talking about this way that Jesus came and died and suffered, and you're like, oh, <laughs> and kind of upsetting the Jews. Uh, so we share in his glory, we share in his inheritance, and we share in his suffering too. So we share in his glory in a number of ways, the resurrected body, but also in the fact that new heavens and new earth, we, we will be co-heirs, we will be co rulers uh, and we share in his inheritance, but also we, sh- we share in his sufferings. So we'll, we'll finish off with this last couple sections here, 14, 15, 16, uh, starting off with verse 14. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, and this is an idea that he's going to bring up in verse, I think, in 17 or 18, and he's going to bring it up again, in, I think, in chapter 4 or 5. Um, Jesus also shared in these so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death that is the devil. So he became as one of us, and he died as one of us, and he did it for, for two reasons, but verse 14 only says the first of those reasons. The f- and, 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 and the first of those reasons is that his death, he might destroy the one holding the power of death. Okay? 
So there's a couple ideas that I need to clarify. There is in all of us this idea that Satan holds the keys, right? And that Jesus had to go and free us from Satan's hold on us in death. That's not true. The Bible actually says, that it, like, think of uh, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, right? That the lion had to die because the witch had some claim on him. That, that's not true. The Bible says that we, Jesus saved us from the wrath of God. It was God's wrath that we were saved from, not, not, not that. So what is this talking about? Well, this is talking about the way that, that Satan held the power of death, the uh, fear of death, the, um, the ability to wield one last final blow against us. And there was nothing we could look forward to and hope because Jesus hadn't come yet. So we had the power of death. It was something that, ah... Not that. I mean, how many of the how many of the Old Testament people do you read about talking about? Well, when I die, it's just that's the end of the road. They didn't look forward to a hope. So um, let's kind of pause some ideas here. So, what does it mean for him to be destroyed? The the word there is kind of to be made ineffective. To be made ineffective. To destroy the devil is to make him ineffective. Um, and then, uh, so already we can see that we don't see the full fulfillment of this verse, right? Because Satan's still around doing his thing, right? But we will, right? But then we do also see it partly fulfilled, and that we'll, we'll get to that uh, in point two in just a minute. Um, so Christ death saves us from the wrath of God. It proves that he is righteous, and it destroys the devil. Um, and also, if you notice in the in the book of Hebrews... Um, notice how often he talks about Jesus' death being the victory and not the resurrection being the victory. Did you notice that? In verse 14 it said, um, Jesus also shared in these that through his death he might destroy the one holding. The death is the point of, of victory. Um, so he, think of it like this. Jesus' death conquered death. Jesus' work undid the devil's work. And it's kind of like this contrast between the two. And... Um, So death, sin, and the devil, they've been overcome, but we don't see that yet. Um, before Jesus came, people had the fear of death, and then they, had, they were bound to sin. Well, then when Jesus came, we are no longer bound to sin, but we do still struggle with sin, don't we? And we're no longer uh, captivated by the fear of death, but check it out, though, we do still experience fear in death. It's just that the fear of death hasn't, doesn't have a hold over us anymore. We have something to, to hope in. There's a way of saying it. When the fear of death comes on you, you have a hope to look forward to. So, um, and then you get to verse 15. And free those. This is, part, this is the second thing. So I'll, I'll kind of go back and read the verse. Destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. So by destroying the one with the power of, over death, he also removed the fear of death for believers. So this is talking about our hope that we have. And it's gonna, this, is, this idea is going to be built on in the, in throughout the chapters to come. And that takes us to verse 16, which is the verse we're going to end on. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abram's offspring, or Abraham's offspring. Angels cannot be saved. People can. Angels sinned. We sinned. But well, we're given the lifeline, and they aren't. Yet another way of, of contrasting uh, the angels with, um, with Jesus. So, okay. So, to summarize all these things, I made this little thing here. Um, in verses 1 through 4, we saw that why it matters that Jesus is superior to angels. And then in verses 5 through 16, we saw more of um, how as family with Jesus, we have a lot, of, we have a lot at stake, which is going to mean a lot. Uh, to Jews who are considering going back uh, because they have lost a lot of their earthly family and connections. Um, so something that's still going on for Jews when they get saved. So, uh, And obviously there's an overarching theme that we can look to Jesus and hope. Um, so any questions on, on this section of Hebrews? Got a little murky in places, but uh, Rick and, uh, and Todd helped bell us out, huh? Any questions? Lord, I pray that you'd be with us throughout the week. Help us to uh, to learn from your word and just really have a hunger for it. And uh, Lord, open up our, our 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 minds to see you, or I'm sorry, our eyes to see you, and our and our minds to think about you, and not our problems, and our ears to hear you, Lord. Um, let our mouths be filled with praise for you, 
and uh, Lord, help us to always focus on you as the King, you on you as the as the pioneer for us, Lord. Um, that as 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 you go is as we go, and uh, Lord, thank you for everything you're doing. I pray you continue to touch our families. Uh, I pray you bring healing and and bring salvation, Lord. We love you. Amen.